No, I'll tell that on Sunday. I know. Hey, just trust me, Bob. Trust me. Trust me. All right. Trust me. I know. I know. You're leading me, and I, I'm, I'm trying to follow. I'm not doing a very good job. All right. We're going to try to project for you. If we run into too much trouble with it projecting, uh, I, may, I may pull back from it. But here we go. We're continuing to try to work with things a little bit here. Oh, that's not the one I want. Yes, it is the one I want. There we go. I'd like to start tonight, and even before we turn to, uh, to the Scriptures, and A.V., if you wouldn't mind pulling down the, uh, the, the lights above me, just pull them down a little bit. Dim them just a little bit. It'll help folks see there, and I think we're still going to be okay on the video. Um, good. Thanks, guys. Um, one of the things that, as a Christian, we try to do is uh, the premise, and, and I'm going to pose it to you in a question which is, how do I follow God? How do I follow God? Now, I think as we look at the Scriptures tonight, we will, it, it will be very clear that we should follow God. So, first of all, let me be clear that I'm assuming that we should follow God. That's, that's an assumption coming into this lesson. But I think it's one that, that will be borne out by the Scriptures themselves. And so I feel safe in doing that. And so let's move from the premise that we need to, to how do we do this? As Christians, in fact, the name Christian actually, did I lose it? Yeah, we may not win tonight. We may lose tonight. We'll see. We'll see what happens here. As Christians, we are called Christians because we are ones who follow Christ. That's what the name Christian actually means. It's a partisan. It's a follower. It's one who goes after Christ. And, of course, we understand that Christ is God himself. And so the premise of needing to follow God is one that I think most of you here tonight can understand and start with. But how do we do it? Now, what I'd like to do is, is start with a metric by laying out a little bit what you shouldn't do. Yeah, I keep losing it. We'll see where we go. You all distracted yet? Don't be too distracted. I'm going to try this, see what our problems are here and see if I can work them out. If not, if you hang with me, then we'll be okay tonight. Um, I'll put it back up in just a sec when I can be active with it. One of the great examples of that I believe we should not do, the problem we have in following God, is exemplified in the passage in Genesis in which Isaac is bamboozled, tricked, deceived by his wife and their son, Jacob. I want to read to you a little something that encapsulates this. And here I'll try to put it up on the board. And let's see whether I can pull it off. No, it's dying on me. I don't even have it. All right, forget it. You all just have to listen. In the midst of this, Jacob comes in. In verse 21 of Genesis chapter 27, Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you are really Esau. So Jacob went closer to his father, and Isaac touched him. Now, you all know what had happened. They'd killed a goat. They'd, they'd cooked the meat. They'd taken the skins. They'd put it on him. They'd put Jacob's smelly clothes, his outsidey clothes on him. And so all of Isaac's senses were being assaulted by what was Esau. And notice this. So Jacob went closer to his father, and Isaac touched him. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's, Isaac said. But he did not recognize Jacob because Jacob's hands felt hairy just like Esau's. So Isaac prepared to bless Jacob. The biggest problem, and so I'd like to start when we ask the question, how do I follow God? I'd like to start with the basic premise of what you don't do. The thing that gets most in the way of us following God is when we follow our senses. When we follow our senses. Now, to back this up a little bit, let me turn you over to a passage you know well. You don't even have to turn there to know it. 
Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You see, our understanding, by definition, is based upon a sensory world. Now, I'm not telling you that as you follow God, you do not learn how to be a spiritual being, how to follow the Spirit of God. And so there is understanding that comes from that. But when you set God aside and you are left to your own devices, all you have is what you can touch, what you can taste, what you can smell, what you can hear, and what you can see. That's our world. Now, I'm not here telling you that it's wrong, that that world's bad. God made that world, and God made us creatures of that world. But we need to understand that that is not the totality of existence. In other words, it's incomplete. The mistake, and I give Isaac to you simply as an image in your mind, that as you are seeking to follow God, what are you paying attention to? What's persuading you? What are you trusting? Because if you're going to follow God, you cannot trust or depend, if you will, on your understanding. You cannot be impressed by your own wisdom. Now, this is a very personal thing for me. I'm a highly educated individual and in my areas my fields I'm an expert yet those areas which by the way align very closely with the work that I do as a pastor which makes it even more of a temptation to rely upon my own brains my own understanding my own skills my own human abilities Yet the Proverbs writer says, do not depend on your understanding and don't be overly impressed by what you think you know. Now remember, the starting question is how do I follow God? And so the starting answer to that question tonight is you cannot follow God by depending on your understanding and by trusting your skill. Now, many within uh, the, those, the, the movement of Christianity have taken that and have said, you don't need any education. You don't need any intelligence. You should totally ignore your senses. That is not what Scripture says. It says don't depend on it. It says don't be impressed by it. I don't need God to speak to me. Now, this is going to sound really dumb because it's an obvious statement. I don't need God to speak to me to know that I need to brush my teeth. I don't know about the rest of you, but in the morning, I usually get some biofeedback that tells me I need to brush my teeth. I don't even need my wife to tell me, dear, you're really rank. It, it usually wafts up from here to here, and I go, ooh, whew, that's some pretty rank stuff. What about you, buddy? Did you brush stink in the morning? Yeah. I mean, you get, you get a little biofeedback. It's, it doesn't take any rocket science. I don't need God to speak to me to know, boy, that would improve things if I got some toothpaste. And scrub my teeth. Make sense? It's not that we ignore the world God made us in and how he created us to live in, in that world. But it is an acknowledgement that when it comes to following God, those are insufficient. They're incomplete. Even when everything that I can touch, taste, smell, hear, and see has been factored in, I still don't have the complete 
picture. Now let's ask a very large question. How often do you make momentous decisions based upon your five senses and without asking God? Now, we're not here to condemn anybody. We're not here to condemn ourselves. But we need to be honest about this. I'm not just barking up a tree that I don't know what we're talking about. This is a problem for us because we become dependent on our understanding. And we do get impressed by our wisdom. What's really bad about it is, is as you serve Jesus, you will get smarter. That's not a possibility. That is a foregone conclusion. The longer you serve Jesus, the smarter you will become. Now, some of you look and you go, man, I still look pretty dumb. Yeah, but imagine how dumb you used to be. You don't just compare forward to what you want to be. you got to look back to how dumb you used to be. you come a long way, baby. You will get smarter. Don't be impressed by it. Remember where it comes from. So the first thing is, is if I can give it to you, don't go with what you feel. Now, there's two senses in that. Feel in the sense of sense, but feel is also emotion. So many times we act on our emotions. And if you're going to follow God, you can't do that. It's not that God doesn't understand emotions. He gave you emotions. But it's an incomplete picture. It's not the whole story. This is why you trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you don't depend on your understanding. You take it into account. You just don't depend on it. You seek His will. Knowing that if you seek Him, you will find Him. Knowing if you go after Him, He will show you what to do. And what gets in the way of this is if you're impressed by your wisdom so that you think, well, I don't need to seek him in this. Now, moving from the negative statement, don't follow your senses. Don't rely on your human abilities. Well, then what do I do? All right, fine, Steve, we got you on the, on the part of what not to do. What do we do? Well, let me turn you to, I would like to submit a couple of, of areas uh, for your consideration. None of this is going to be new to you, but hopefully this will jog you into reevaluating in your life how you're doing in this. And none of this is to be taken as condemnation. So everybody look at your neighbor and say, no condemnation. Go ahead, find somebody, look, look at another person and say, no condemnation. You're all alone over there, Amy, no condemnation. Learning, no condemnation. All right. So, John chapter 10, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from the stranger because they don't know his voice. Now, Jesus is dealing with a number of things in this passage, but what is a part of this is the realization that in a relationship with God, you are expected through that relationship, not as a prerequisite of the relationship, but as a byproduct of that relationship with God, to come to know the voice of God. And you know what's really cool? Now, I know there are some people that hear an audible voice from God. I know that. We've got scriptural examples of people who have audibly heard the voice of God. But what is amazing to me, and I don't think it's by accident, is that the vast majority of us have never heard the audible voice of God. 
And on the basis of this, I'd like to submit to you that when Jesus says, they know my voice, he's not talking about what you can hear with your ear. Because by definition, Cody, unless somebody makes a sound, you can't hear it. That's human auditory. Somebody's got to speak for you to hear them. If you had closed your eyes and not read my lips, you'd have no clue I was even speaking, let alone knowing what I said to you. The rest of the congregation has no idea what I said to you because they couldn't see my lips. I made not a sound. So what we have to be careful of is that Jesus' instruction to hear his voice is not a human, physical instruction. It's spiritual. And in your relationship with God, you should expect as you follow him, as you seek him, as you place your trust in him, that you will learn to know his voice. And again, not in a literal sense, but again in imagery. Isaac would have been much better off if he had listened to the voice of Jacob rather than have trusted what he felt. All of your senses can be telling you one thing, but when the voice of God says something, you need to follow it. Everything that you touch, that you taste, that you smell, that you hear, and that you see is screaming at you one thing. But if you want to follow God, you've got to have trust and dependence, not on your senses, but on the voice of the Master. This is why it is without faith you can't please God. Because it takes faith to believe that voice. To hear that voice. Now, our examples are pathetic, and yet they're significant. To this day, I have no clue why God, I mean, I'd have paid less money than I paid for my house. I'd have had a beautiful, solid, cherry cabinets, brand new for my wife. Those of you that have been in my kitchen, you know how bad my kitchen is. Solid cherry. Corian countertops. It's a gorgeous house. It would have been bigger. All the bedrooms would have been bigger. I would have paid less money, remember? I would have had a two-car garage instead of a single-car garage. I mean, everything of this house was the better thing. Everything my senses told me said, nab this baby. I didn't even talk the lady down. She was in a divorce. I probably could have got her down another 5000 I'd be even better off. But the voice of the Lord said, don't touch it. Sometimes the voice of the Lord says, go, and everything screams, no. And sometimes the voice of the Lord says, don't move, and everything screaming, now's your chance. Grab it. This is an opportunity of a lifetime and God's being a stick in the mud. He's just raining on your parade. Oh, he's just not wanting you to have the best thing. You remember the last time that argument was made? Humanity blew it. We took out the fruit of the tree and we ate and everything cracked and broke from there on. God wants you to be held back. He doesn't want you to know. You must, if you're going to follow God as a Christian, you must follow his voice. You've got to follow his voice. Now, many times it's, it's presented in the aspect that you've got to develop your relationship with God. You've got to know his voice. If you don't know his voice, you can't follow him. I'm telling you, if you are in a relationship with God, God is talking to you to develop your knowledge of his voice. He didn't say that my sheep might know my voice. He said my sheep know my voice. In other words, 
The motion and the action for you to be equipped to follow him is in his court. He's talking to you. He's developing you. He is constantly doing things so that you can know his voice. And consequently, you then, by virtue of the knowledge of his voice, you know when it's not his voice. What will stop it if you rely on your own understanding? If you're impressed by your own wisdom? If you refuse to trust the Lord. Now, growing up with my parents, it's been an interesting thing. Because my parents are extremely pragmatic. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't take chances on anything. No, it's not a curse word. It's, it's, what allows you, it's what allows you to eat a good meal every day. If you're pragmatic, it's a good thing. People who aren't pragmatic starve. There's other people who are pragmatic that do starve. I'm not saying that. But if you're not pragmatic, you're going, you're going to skip a few meals because you're going to make some dumb choices. They're extremely pragmatic. They're very practical. Everything has a plan. It has to make sense. But then as I grew older, I'd watch that they'd take moves that, man, it didn't all add up. Now, I'd, I've watched mom and dad work it over and make sure that they weren't just moving in their own emotions and all that. But when the voice of the Lord speaks, you, if you're going to follow God, you've got to follow his voice. You've got to follow his voice. And by the way, don't blame him for your own stupidity. I see a few of you smiling at me. I'm glad you are. Don't blame him for your own stupidity. Chalk it up to a learning lesson about knowing his voice. And actually, not so much knowing his voice, but knowing how to ignore your understanding. Hello? Because a lot of times what it is is we're looking for an excuse to do what we want to do. Because ladies and gentlemen, the times when the voice of God leads in a direction that I'm in total agreement with are few and far between. I'm either scared or I'm ready to go and he's saying hold or, you know. You've got to follow the voice of God. And you can have confidence in your relationship with God that it's developing within you a knowledge of his voice. Then it becomes a question, are you going to trust your understanding? Are you going to rely upon your wisdom? Are you going to be impressed by your skills? Or are you going to rely upon the leading of the voice of God? Because he comes and he leads the sheep. He leads them. And they follow him. Because... They know his voice. Second, remember, how do I follow God? That's the question. So you're not relying on your senses. You're not relying on your skills, your wisdom. You're following the voice of God. Second, I'll turn you to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Now, this few verses I'm going to read to you at the end of Matthew chapter 7 are the summation of a long sermon known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's multi-chapter, and Jesus, it's very famous. That's where the Beatitudes are found and many other well-known sayings of Jesus. Jesus makes this statement. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. And then he gives us an image. He says he's wise like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it, doesn't follow it, is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come, and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. If you're going to follow God, you've got to follow His Word. Now understand, we've drawn too many sharp distinctions between these various things that I'm bringing to you. Because I could make the case to you that His voice and His Word are 
They're one and the same. They're coming from God. But these are different mechanisms of God speaking to us. It amazes me how many people know what the Bible says, but then excuse themselves from doing it. Yeah, Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name baptized, apostolic, holy living Christians. Well, well, you know, preacher, you got to. Remember, I told you all, I was raised by wolves, right? Wolves are severe. Wolves are, wolves are wild. Wolves are not moderate. I knew if I could find it in the book, it didn't matter about parental authority. I'd done trumped them. If I could show it in the book, if I could show it in the scriptures, mom and dad would bend to the book. Do you model that to your children? That's a side question. But do you model that to your children? Or do you hold on to that trump card? Well, I'm the parent, bless God. Or does the Bible trump everything? Does it trump your senses? Does it trump your wisdom? Does it trump your authority? Do you follow the word? You know, I've been open with you and told you. My perceptions, my ideas were, you know, as the man, I was the boss of the house. I was supposed to be a kind boss, but I was boss nonetheless. Well, the Word's been speaking to me the last few years. Pernicious thing. Irritating thing. I ain't the boss. He's the boss. And that didn't exempt the house either. So it meant when it came to me and Regina and figuring out what life was going to do, I didn't hold the trump card. I wasn't the one that made the final decision. No, the two of us together submitted ourselves to God, and he made the final decision. That's a revolt and develop for, for me. I'd rather that the whole world do what I tell them to do. Now, those of you that look at me and go, you're an arrogant cuss. Well, I am, okay? Love me, hate me, forgive me. Put up with me, whatever. I am a type A personality. Type A exponential. I come by it honest, but still, nonetheless, I am what I am. Yeah, I do. I take after my mama and my daddy. I've got it double. Do you let the word change you? Or do you impose, do you impose your thoughts, your culture, your understanding, your wisdom onto the word? I mean, we can look back in time and culture and look at the Christians of the past who would use the Word of God to claim that Brother Keith was less of a man and should be enslaved by me simply because I got less, not more, that's the joke, less melanin in my skin. Not more, less. I'm like missing some. So what are we imposing on the word today? What's our culture imposing on the word today? I'm not trying to have all of you go home and all be a nervous wreck. That's not my point. My point is this. We, if we are going to follow God, must be willing to follow his word. It trumps our understanding. It trumps our experience. It trumps everything. So what's your attitude towards the word? So by the way, if you're attending a church that doesn't spend too much time in the word, I would be a little concerned. I'd be a little concerned. Because Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, they will never pass away. 
The psalmist in the Old Testament said, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. That's our foundation. We all got culture. We all got backgrounds. We all got opinions. In fact, here on the East Coast, we all got about three or four opinions to the person. Where's the word in your life? Are you following the word? Because if you're going to follow God, you got to not rely on your understanding. You got to not be impressed by your wisdom. You've got to follow his voice. You've got to follow his word. Finally, the third thing that I'd like to draw your attention to, Romans chapter 8. Paul writes to the church, and he says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You have to, if you're going to follow God, follow His Spirit. You have to be led by His Spirit. Now again, remember, there's no question, it's one God. These are different Delivery methods, if you will, or different ways of speaking about a single God. But he does speak to us. He does move upon us. He does lead us and guide us in distinct manners by his voice, by his spirit, by his word. They're never in conflict, but they are unique. They're different ways in which he moves. Jesus tells us that Paul's right. Because he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever He receives from me. There is an intervention that should be common in the life of a Christian who is following God. And that is where God, through His Spirit, leads us in a direction that at the time, we cannot make sense of it. We can see a concrete example of this in the book of Acts. Where the church goes and sells everything they have. Puts it into a common pot. And live communally. Made no sense. Even cause trouble. Because now the church was responsible for all the widows. Not the individual families. Because everybody put their money all in the common pot. And so the Hebrew widows were bickering with the Grecian widows. And, and uh, she's getting more bread than me. I'm getting the last of the soup. So bad attitudes are happening. The apostles are having trouble. We can look back and see the wisdom of the Spirit. Looking forward to the destruction of Jerusalem that was coming in just a few short years. Jesus probably died somewhere around the age of, or around the year of 29 or 30. If you want to know the details of that, come talk to me later. I won't go through them now. But that's my, that's my best guesstimate, somewhere around 29 or 30. So that meant that about 40 years later, property prices were going to plummet. And actually, they plummeted probably about a decade earlier than that as rioting continued to rise, as problems began to evolve, and as the Roman armies began to amass. What about all those Christians that Paul persecuted? God had prepared them that they could pick up and leave at the drop of a hat because they didn't own anything. Oh, for the day that I could pick up at the drop of a hat. Whew. 
God tells me I get to go to Africa, it would take me at least a year to get ready to go. If not longer. I gotta sell stuff. I gotta get rid of stuff. I gotta I gotta liquidate stuff. I gotta I gotta I gotta I gotta move permanence to impermanence. Spirit led them. Spirit prepared them. They were led by the Spirit. Now, if you got your focus on this world, you are really not going to like following the leading of the Spirit. Because the Spirit is going to lead you to do things in the present that make no sense in the present. Because He is directing you from the future. And all you can see, and God doesn't have a problem with it, all you can see, is the present. And the future never makes sense from the present. It only makes sense from the future. Only when you can look back can you see, wow, God was with me on that one. Wow, there was the voice of God in that one. Boy, I, I, I heard His voice there. Oh my goodness, His Spirit was leading me there. You don't ever feel that when you're in the middle of it. You don't ever see that when you're in the middle of it. It makes no sense. Because we are limited by the present. We, by definition, cannot live in the future. Now, those of you that are like me and like to dream, that's all it is. It's dreams. Only God speaks things which do not currently exist as if they are going to come to pass. Only God has that ability to create and to, and to empower. You and I are stuck with the present. But if we are going to follow God, we've got to follow the Spirit. Because Jesus told us, Paul told us that those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the daughters of God. They are, they are His children. And Jesus told us why. Because the Spirit, it's going to lead you. It's going to guide you into truth. And I know we use truth doctrinally, but can I, can I give you another sense of truth? It's going to re lead you into reality. He's going to lead you into a reality that comes through Him. Let me tell you something by experience. The reality God has for you is always bigger than you. You're never up to the task. You don't have the ability. But He does. And He'll empower you. He'll prepare you. And that's where the problem comes. Because when you do that a few times, guess what? You end up a lot bigger person than you started. You end up a lot smarter than you started. You end up with a lot more experience than you had before. And that's where you need to remind yourself where that all came from. And don't be overly impressed by that. Some of you need to look at the jobs you work and the money you make. You need to get out. I've said this before. You need to get out your, 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 your 1099s and your, and your W-2s and you need to sit down and look at 10 years. And you need to look at 15. You need to look at 20 and you need to see what God has done. You say, well, I worked it. Oh. Yeah, you worked it. You got up every day and you were the same dumb self you were 10 years ago. You say, I'm offended by that. And that's why you're having problems following God. Because the reality is you're still as dumb as you ever were. But God's been adding to you. He's been adding to you. He's been adding to you. It's not yours. It's His. I've told the story before. Maybe I'm getting old. I'm telling stories over and over again. But they're relevant. Remember coming down the stairs. I know exactly where it was, too. Coming down the stairs of Anderson Hall at Temple University. I just left a room, punching my cohort in the Ph.D. program, whining and complaining, scared to death they weren't going to pass their exam, scared to death they weren't going to finish their Ph.D. program. Here I come. I'm jogging down the steps. And I thought, man, those dumb people, what are they so worried about? And the Lord just grabbed me. He said, you need to straighten that attitude up. He said, you haven't done one lick of this program alone. You're all impressed. You're married. You got kids. You're teaching at Urshan Graduate School. You're still a pastor. 
buddy boy, you ain't all that. I've been helping you. Now, if you would like to have this graphically demonstrated for you, then I'll back off and let you see what it's like to do it on your own. But if you'll just straighten your attitude out, I won't make you go through that. Because you have not faced one thing in this program on your own. I've opened doors. I've blessed things. I've touched in circumstances. I've done this. Oh, by the way, I get the blessings of it. I got the plaque that hangs on the wall. I get all the benefits of it. And the Lord doesn't begrudge us the benefits of his blessings. But don't be impressed. By all of the wisdom you gain as you serve God. Don't forget where it came from. Don't forget who gave it to you. Now, if you run into a pompous preacher, you probably don't want to pop his bubble. But tell me who he is and I'll go pop it. I are one. Sometimes when you are one, you can say stuff and get away with it. You know, you all think I just do it because it's funny. I'm doing it because I'm reminding myself. When God called me to follow him, he said, I want you to be my son. When he called me to preach, he says, hey, buddy, let me show you the lineup. On the end, you have the rooster. And on the other side, you have the jackass. And in the middle is you. There you go, buddy. I can use a rooster, I can use a jackass, and I can use you. God's not impressed by my ability to speak, by my all the stuff that he anoints anyway. See, I, I need to remember the time I went to Trenton and preached. My God. Oh, y'all need to thank God every day that the Lord anoints me when I step to this pulpit. You would not want to listen to that all the time. That's what I had ability in. All the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the experience that I currently bear only comes because I followed His voice, because I followed His word, and because I followed His spirit. It's come because of Him, not because of me. I'm still what I always was. And when I lose that, when you and I lose that, that's when we get into trouble. That's when we create pickles and problems. Because we're relying on our skills and our abilities. And that's where the saying that I've said to you many times is, is inside the blessings of God lies a cursing. And it's up to you whether it becomes a cursing or whether you can continue to receive the blessing. Because it all depends on whether you take it unto yourself. Because he will lead you and guide you into truth. You will get smarter. You will have more wisdom. You will gain experience. Doesn't matter what your area is. You will get better than you used to be. But it's all because of him. It's all through Him. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. It comes from above. So are you following God? Well, the way that you can answer that question is by checking out, are you listening to His voice? Are you even asking to hear His voice? Are you even pausing to say, hey, I need to hear from you. And not expecting it to literally come through your ear. One of the things for me, uh, and, and some of this is, is relevant because there's a maturity. When you first come to God, a lot of times God will speak through other human beings. He'll speak into your life through the person who witnessed to you. He'll speak into your life through the preacher. Well, in my life, I spent my whole life being spoken to by my father and my mother. The vast majority of what God has said to me has been through there. This is a rather pernicious problem. 
Because I found out a few years ago, as I was struggling to figure out what I was supposed to do and how I was supposed to conduct myself and what I was supposed to operate in, the Lord said to me and said, Son, you do realize that your father is no longer pastor. He says it means that there are certain areas of responsibility that I no longer talk to him about. His counsel is counsel based on the past. It is not based on the future. Because it's not his responsibility anymore, and I'm not talking to him. Talk to your father. But would you mind talking to me first? Now, when God talks to you like that, maybe that doesn't bother you, but that kind of that disconcerted me a little bit. That got under my craw a little bit. I went, oh, my goodness. Then I had to break a habit. Because you know what I do? Every major decision I have, I go talk to Pop. I go find out what Mom thinks. I reach out to my parents. That's how I've lived. I still talk to Mom and Dad. But I've had to break a habit so that I go solicit the voice of God. When Joshua signed the compact with those tribes, and I'm blanking, Gibeonites. Is it Gibeonites? Yeah, the Gibeonites who came and tricked him. The whole thing's done. He signed the compact that he can't annihilate them. He can't destroy them. He can't take their land. It's a perpetual treaty. God comes to him and says, you didn't talk to me. I am not duped by what you saw. I am not duped by what you touched. Moldy bread and cracked wineskins don't trick me. But you didn't ask. So I didn't tell. And you now are stuck with a treaty. Because you didn't ask me. Are you asking God? And don't be surprised that sometimes God will say, I don't care. Do what you want. That's where some people get too hyper-spiritual. If you need to correct the habit, go ahead. Ask him whether you should get the blue sparkly or the purple sparkly toothbrush. Just don't be surprised when he says to you, I don't care. Get the pink one if you want. But if you get yourself in a habit... Of asking God, I'd like your opinion, Lord. Have the preacher preach to me about this. Lead me in your word about this. Let your spirit guide me about it. If you get yourself in the habit there, you won't have any problem with God. So I don't care. Even as opinionated as I am, there's some stuff that I say to my wife when she asks me what I want or what we want to do. I go, I don't care. You pick. Even as opinionated as I am. There's some stuff I go, I don't care. You pick. God's going to say to you that. But then there's going to be other things that you won't necessarily have thought that God's going to have an opinion on. God will go, whoa, 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 let's talk here. I mean, seriously, I paid more money. In my world, you don't do that. You don't pay more money for less. That's not what you do. Not in my world. You don't pay more money than for less. I paid more money for less house. And you know what was really pernicious about it? The house that was more, and I would have paid less. I felt checked in the spirit. My wife felt checked in the spirit. And my dad and mom felt checked in the spirit. So then when I get to the house I live in now, it's more money, less house. And I go up to the house, I feel good in it. And I'm scared to death. Pop's no way going to feel good in it. Because that was one of my checks. That was how I was going to check out. And he's like, go for it. I said, well, should I offer him less like what I was going to offer the house? And he's like, no, offer him full price. More for less. God doesn't always make sense. You know what the funny part is? I still can't tell you why I shouldn't have that house with the cherry cabinets and the Corian countertops. I have no clue. But I trust God. More than I trust my own wisdom. More than I trust my own sensibilities. Because I have been in a relationship with God that I know His voice. Because he's taught me his voice. 
I know his voice. I doubt it at times. I struggle with it at times. I wrestle with it at times. All those kinds of things. But if I'm going to follow God, I've got to follow his voice. I've got to follow his word. And I've got to follow his spirit. And I've got to not follow my wisdom, my knowledge that's based upon my senses. So, Kenny, everything says that I'm crazy. I know. I've been there before. I'm sitting right, I've sat right where you sat. Everything in your senses says this guy's crazy. But there's another voice that keeps speaking to you. It won't go away, will it? That says, I know what I'm talking about. So now you have a choice. Your wisdom, your knowledge, your experience, or the voice of God. Because you know his voice. That's why you throw such fits about it. Because you don't want to admit that it's God. Because if it's God, none of us want to obey it. When we want our own way, we don't want it to be his voice. Because then we've got to obey it. Now, I picked on Kenny tonight. Ah, Kenny's not the only one that's done this. So I ask you tonight, do an assessment. Look at your walk with God. Figure out, am I following God? And the way you figure it out is, Am I relying on my wisdom, my knowledge, my expertise? Am I listening to the voice of the Lord? Am I following that voice? Am I following his word? And am I following his spirit? Let's stand. Lift your hands to the Lord and thank him for his word. Can we do it together? Jesus, we love you tonight. God, I worship you and I praise you and I thank you for your goodness your mercy and your kindness to us, Lord.